Welcome to chapter 19, and this is nursing care of patients with immune disorders. So what are we gonna cover in this chapter? Not every single thing, but a couple very important things. Um, what is the expectation when we're done with this chapter? You're gonna understand um, anaphylactic reaction, okay? You're gonna talk about pathophysiology for disorders of the immune system, for example, autoimmune disorders, right? Um, signs and symptoms of immune disorders, medical treatments, nursing interventions, how we diagnose, how we take care of patients, and how you evaluate the effectiveness of our nursing interventions. So the first place that we start is the three categories. So you've got hypersensitivity reactions, which are allergic reactions. Then you have autoimmune disorders, and then you have immune deficiencies. So let's try to clarify each of those and try to make it as easy to understand as possible. Um, the first one, hypersensitivity reactions. In other words, an allergy is a hyper response to something that's benign. <clears throat> Excuse me. So allergic reactions can go anywhere from something very mild to something so extreme that they can prove to be fatal, like anaphylactic shock. Okay. So anaphylaxis is just an extreme hypersensitivity reaction to something benign, but for some reason, for that particular person, their body cannot tolerate it. Hemolytic transfusion reactions, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail about this one, just understand, someone's getting a blood transfusion, number one, reaction's gonna happen usually in the first 15 minutes to half hour. Um, they can happen anytime, but it's important that you understand about blood products and blood transfusions. That was in our previous video. We're not gonna talk about the measles, and briefly, I'm gonna go over transplant rejection, okay? Um, with autoimmune disorders, there are thousands, I mean, literally thousands of autoimmune disorders. And I know I've spoken about this before, but the thought process is that somehow, and it, this is idiopathic, so in other words, when you ask us, you know, why does this happen, we go, uh, because we don't know. Um, for some reason, the person's own immune system that is set up to protect them turns on them and somehow attacks things that belong to them. With the rheumatoid arthritis, it's autoimmune, and the immune system is attacking the joints. Ulcerative colitis, the immune system is attacking the colon, the large bowel. Multiple sclerosis, the, nerve, the immune system is attacking the nerves. Lupus. With lupus, it can go, lupus can range from mild to severe, and lupus, the immune system, can attack the skin, the tissue, the cells, the organs, right? And then type 1 diabetes mellitus, right, which used to be known as juvenile diabetes. That's believed to be autoimmune, and the, the belief is, is that two things happen. Number one, the immune system just kind of wakes up and attacks the pancreas, so it doesn't make insulin. And then number two, the immune system changes the cell's sensitivity to carbohydrates and to insulin. But we're not going to get into all that. But anyway, there's myasthenia gravis, there's sarcoidosis, the list goes on and on. Just understand, with an autoimmune, auto means mine, and immune, the immune system. Autoimmune means that my immune system is attacking me. Okay, and it's not supposed to do that. <clears throat> so once you understand how it happens, then you can better understand the kinds of treatments that we use, right? And then third on the hit list are immune deficiencies. We are not going to get into hypogammaglobulinemia. That's a mouthful. Say it three times fast. But I do. We are going to talk about AIDS. But the next chapter, chapter twenty, is just HIV/AIDS. And so really, that's going to be the focus of chapter twenty. Okay. So getting through this chapter, when we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, hypersensitivity reactions, you know, they go into a lot of detail to, you know, the way the tissue is injured by the response. We're not going to go into that. No one's going to ask you about that. Okay. Basically, here's what I want you to come away from this lecture understanding that with an allergy, a hypersensitivity reaction is an allergy. Okay. The body responds in a way to a substance, a food, a drug, a bee sting, normally that would not bother anyone else, but at that person, it becomes a severe reaction. 
an anaphylactic reaction will happen immediately. I mean, you can't even blink your eyes. And when it starts, it starts with pruritus and urticaria, which is the hives and the itchiness. And it will just go from that to uh, swollen tongue, swollen oral mucosa, swollen throat, constricted airway, and it can, it can cause death almost instantaneously, okay? Um, with allergic rhinitis, I just want you to know what the term means. Allergic rhinitis is like hay fever, seasonal allergies, I get those, pollen bothers me, sneezing, nasal itching, runny nose, itchy red eyes, those kinds of things. Atopic dermatitis, again, with these, I don't want you to give them too much time, I want you to be familiar with them and with the terminology. That's the goal here for these. So atopic dermatitis, it's eczema. Eczema is an allergic reaction, believe it or not. And let me tell you, children that have asthma will oftentimes, very frequently, wind up with eczema or vice versa, all right? So it's a skin response that's an allergic response. They get the pruritus, swelling, itching. The skin gets super, super dry, scaly almost, okay? And then we have, you know, true anaphylaxis. And anaphylaxis is just a sudden release of histamine. And that's something that your body makes. And it, you, you get flooded with histamine. When this happens, all those minor things like the runny eyes and the runny nose, they are so amplified that all that swelling and all the histamine and all the phlegm, everything swells and the patient will have, you know, severe low blood pressure, hypotension, tachycardia, and they'll have a heart attack, cardiac arrest if we don't do something. Well, what do we do? They need immediate treatment. So we're talking about usually epinephrine, an EpiPen, or an antihistamine. So they're the two I want you to know, the EpiPen, and then for antihistamines, typically what do we give? Diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, okay? You need to know that, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. And oxygen, because typically they are deprived of oxygen. Um, don't worry about, you know, all the others that are listed here. I just want you to know about the epi and the antihistamines. And what we give is dependent on the level of the severity of, of the reaction of the patient. So in other words, it's clinical judgment. So if they're having a severe reaction, we're gonna give them epi, right? If it's not so severe, then possibly, you know, diphenhydramine. So this comes with experience, I promise you. And we'll talk more about that. Don't worry about the vasopressors and the corticosteroids and all those things right now. The big thing for you as nurses is to recognize the response. When you give a patient, especially with meds, you know, a patient can have gone their whole life and not been allergic to anything, and then suddenly they get this new drug, or even a drug they've had before, and they take one dose and they start having a reaction. So it's your job to recognize that and intervene to make sure that, you know, no, no bad outcomes. I keep saying this, you guys are one step between the patient and the grave, okay? Uh, and make sure that you know the terms. So urticaria, the word, it means hives. And they are raised, they're called wheels because they kind of look around. They don't hurt, but they itch. So they're hives. And what they come from, the release of histamine. And what can we do about it? Well, again, we've got to stop the histamine response, which would mean epinephrine, diphenhydramine, okay? So make sure you know that. <clears throat> Angioedema, and you've heard me talk about this quite a lot, and it's a form of urticaria, but instead of the hives or the wheels being on the skin, what's happening is it's the submucosal tissue, right? And so it doesn't hurt, but the swelling is what the problem is. So with angioedema, they get that swelling that's in the tissue, like the oral mucosa and the soft mucosal lining of the throat and that's when they can't breathe, okay? So that's angioedema. Um, that's really all I wanna talk about <clears throat> for that. Just, you know, when you go through uh, nursing care, make sure you understand what's your job. What's their respiratory status? What's their lever level of consciousness, right? What do we have to teach them? 
you know, so that this doesn't happen again. And, oh, afterthought, for level of consciousness, make sure that you are familiar with and understand the Glasgow Coma Scale. If you do not, that's something that we will talk about. But you need to know the Glasgow Coma Scale. And that is the way we determine a patient's responsiveness, put a number on it, and then it's universally understood what that particular patient's level of consciousness would be. Okay? We're not going to get into type 2 hypersensitivity reactions. I know that they're in your book, but uh, not going not gonna to talk about them, right? I want to get to... Um, what is very important, which is, and we are fast forwarding to transplant rejection, okay? If you have an organ that is failing, and it could be liver, kidney, lung, heart, right? I mean, they're the big ones. Um, and if you are a candidate, in other words, there's a very specific list of criteria that a patient has to meet to become a candidate for an organ, okay? And what that means is, is, you know, they have to be otherwise healthy. So, you know, if an 18-year-old is killed in a car accident and they're an organ donor, we want to make sure that we give those organs to someone who's going to be able to make the most use of them, okay? So you have kidney failure, you need a kidney, up, oh, you, there's a kidney. They give you a call and they have a kidney for you. When we put the kidney in your body, even though your body needs the kidney, your body doesn't understand that. And your immune system sees that new kidney, that transplanted organ or tissue as a foreign object, like something that needs to be destroyed. And it's also called host versus graft syndrome. So what happens is as soon as that organ gets put into the patient, the patient's white blood cells go insane and basically attack the new organ. And they're gonna, they're gonna destroy it. So what do we do to prevent transplant rejection? Well, it's happening because of the immune response. So we have to shut down the patient's immune response. In other words, we're gonna give them medications that are immunosuppressants, that are going to suppress the body's ability to make white blood cells so that they don't, that their white blood cells don't kill their new kidney or liver or whatever the organ is. Um, make sure you understand how that works, right? And um, I did have a drug on the list of meds that is for nursing three, and that is cyclosporine, also known as sand immune. That is the drug of choice for transplant rejection prevention. It is an immunosuppressant. So basically what we're going to do until the day that patient dies, we're going to suppress their immune response. So you can imagine the risk the patient has as far as risk for other types of infe infections. They're going to be susceptible because they don't have an immune response anymore, but they have a new kidney. So they're not going to die, right? All right. So just make sure that you understand that. If you have questions, let's, we'll talk about them afterwards. Um, next, we're going to move to autoimmune disorders. These are probably the most baffling, perplexing things that have the whole medical community basically in a conundrum because we don't know why. It happens to some and it doesn't happen to others. It does tend to run in families, but not everybody in the family. The immune system recognizes the body's own cells and organs, skin, tissue as foreign. Back. All right, well, that little interruption was my cat trying to go out my door. So anyway, sorry. Um, so uh, where was I? I was talking about autoimmune disorders. And what do we do to treat them? Well, it's the same thing as what we do to prevent a transplant rejection. What we're going to do is shut down the immune system, right? That's pretty much all we can do. Now, there are, you know, lots of classes of medications, but there's one medication that ATI and the Board of Nursing they love this medication. And one of them's going to ask you about it, and that med is methotrexate. So methotrexate is an old, old drug. It's been around forever and ever, and it is a chemotherapeutic agent. Um, it is used for cancer, uh, specifically breast cancer. 
but it also because of the fact that chemotherapy is myelosuppressive and myelo meaning in the in the bone marrow myelosuppressive it suppresses bone marrow activity when it does that it suppresses the bone marrow's ability to make white blood cells and when it does that the patient's not going to have their own cells and tissues destroyed if they don't have white blood cells circulating to do it that makes sense right so make sure you know cyclosporine and make sure you know methotrexate and the side effects in the nursing education, patient education, teaching, testing, all those things, okay? All right. Um, the chapter goes into great detail about lupus. I am not going into great detail about lupus. I will tell you briefly about lupus because it's very, very common now, sadly. Um, many, many people have it. So there are three types. Don't worry about it. Really, the most common one is SLE, which is systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay, which is chronic inflammatory multi-system disorder. What does that mean? It means your immune system is attacking anything and everything. Multi-system. Okay. Um, the etiology: young women, mostly young women of childbearing age. If somebody in the family that's a first-degree relative, and a first-degree relative is mom, dad, sister, brother. Okay, if one of the first degree relatives has it, then it's you're mo more likely to have it. And sadly, African Americans and Hispanics are more at risk than Caucasians. So the signs and symptoms of lupus, really, really, they're all over the place. But I, the only one that I really want to bring to your attention is the butterfly rash. Okay, and so. I don't know if you guys know who the singer Seal is. Probably not. And, you know, I'm old. I know. He was married to Heidi Klum. If you know who she is. At any rate, I'm going to put a picture in here. So with lupus, one of the telltale signs is this butterfly-looking rash on the patient's face. And we call it a butterfly rash because it actually goes over the bridge of the nose and on both of the cheeks. And it can scar and so if you see that, that's a telltale sign that the patient has lupus. <clears throat> but when you look at all of these different signs and symptoms, everything's affected. You know, the dermatological system's affected, hematological system, musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, pulmonary, you name it. And the treatment typically is, like I said, we have to shut down the patient's immune response so that their immune system doesn't kill them. All right, that is it for this chapter. I'm not going to get into all the different, you know, specifics of lupus because that is not something you'll commonly be asked about, but I wanted you to be familiar with it. So I want you to know methotrexate cyclosporine, understand transplant rejection, autoimmune disorders, and anaphylaxis. Got it? All right, that's it for now. Peace.